Hey everybody, um, in our next installment of the Getting to Work series, I wanted to focus on saw sharpening. Um, a lot of people have requested this, uh, this topic. Uh, it's something that if you are a woodworker, you have to do and have to get good at because you're going to be doing this, um, you know, not weekly, uh, but regularly. You're gonna have to be tuning up, touching up your saw teeth, uh, getting them dialed in so that uh, sawing, ripping, cutting joinery, it doesn't become a laborious task. You want uh, these tools to glide right through the wood. It makes it so much easier, and it's very nice to, uh, to cut with a freshly sharpened saw. There's really nothing like it. It's a great feeling. Um, and it is not all that complicated, especially if you're starting out with a, a saw whose plate is straight, whose uh, tooth line doesn't wander up and down uh, if you don't have broken teeth, uh, things like that. If, if you have, like I said, a, a straight plate, straight tooth line, you're in good shape. And uh, you can bring that tool back with just a little bit of work. Uh, if you know us, you know we love antique tools and that's what we go for. So when we're um, in an antique shop or looking for tools, we tend to look a little more closely at the saws. It's not so much we're not looking for like uh, a particular brand or a collectability, we want something that we can put back into use. So we look for straightness and uh, minimal damage. Um, that's the best thing to do. So uh, to sharpen, to sharpen saws, you need a few things. Uh, it's just a pretty basic uh, kit that you need. Um, a few of these things, painter's tape, I'll talk about that. This is good um, if you're sharpening and the phone rings and you don't want to forget where you are, you just put a piece of tape on it. Um, you need a saw set. Now, to describe this, you, you think of teeth all lining up in a row, um, but they actually also tip out from the plate in both directions. And I've talked about this in a previous video um, discussing uh, sawtooth geometry. But if you imagine trying to saw it with this plate through a board, you get through and as more and more of the plate gets down into the board, it would start to bind. So the teeth actually have to cut a kerf a little bit wider than the plate itself so it doesn't bind up. So that's why the teeth are bent out in either direction. And so what I mean by setting is that you're actually bending each tooth opposite directions so that they cut that kerf a little wider than the plate. And so in order to do that with the teeth, you need a saw set. And again, these we, we found these in antique stores and tool places. Um, there are a number of different styles. We like the, the pliers type, the, um, the, the pistol grip type. Um, it's very handy and very quick. There's a hammer setting type and there are a few others. These are very convenient, very adjustable. They're kind of a um, Victorian into the 20th century kind of design, but they work really well. Um, so I'll show you this one. Um, it has this anvil here and you see the numbers around there. Now, these do not exactly correspond with TPI or PPI. It's more of uh, the degree of fineness of the set. So the higher the number, the finer the set. You wouldn't say necessarily that uh, the 13 on here exactly corresponds with a 13 TPI saw. But what it says is that that's a very minimal light set. And you can see as I squeeze the trigger, this um, punch comes down and hits the anvil and that's just moving a little bit but what that is doing is giving a little bit of bend to the tooth and i usually go quite light with the set you can always add more it's harder to bring it back if you've overset a saw and an overset saw becomes harder to control it tends to wander and you got to work more because you're removing more wood so kind of the best set is the minimum amount that makes the cut smooth uh, for things like greenwood, you want a little more set because greenwood tends to bind more. There's more moisture in there. It, it kind of holds on to the saw tighter. But for dry woods and hardwoods and things like that, you really need just a little set. You want to cut a very fine kerf, and that is much more efficient in sawing. So you need a saw set. Um, if you have a question about uh, you want to know how many teeth per inch or points per inch, those are actually two different measurements, but they both rely on an inch. So um, we'll think about it with this saw. This guy, I brought this one in. I thought this was a very lovable little saw. 
So you can see it's like the, the wheat carving. Someone took it and modified it. They cut the horn off, the top one, because they didn't want it anymore for some reason. Um, but then they actually went and whittled <laughs> these little design details in here. You can see the little chamfers where they whittled it down. And I'm guessing that is to make ripping a little better, a little easier. Um, it's a very funny saw. It really stood out when I saw it. But I wanted to bring this in to, uh, to show about sharpening a rip saw. And when, I, when we talk about um, the pitch of a saw, we're talking about the number of teeth per inch or points per inch. So we have TPI and we have PPI. Now, TPI is, is kind of the English way of looking at it. It's measuring from starting from a gullet, so the valley between the teeth. So if we take this one inch rule, we start it at the gullet, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six teeth per inch. Now, if we're going the American way, we're measuring points per inch, right? So we start on a point, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the American saws, they, they just naturally cut finer because they have more points per inch than the English saws have teeth per inch. Um, but actually, you can tell that this is an American saw because it has a number seven stamped there. So this was done the American way uh, with the American measurement. But um, yeah, so a little rule is good if you want to figure out what the pitch of your saw is, how many teeth or points per inch you have. Um, also, you need some files. <clears throat> now, this, this file, this is just a regular, um, like a mill file or a bastard file. It's pretty, um, pretty smooth. It's not an aggressive cut. And you use this for jointing. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate jointing. What it is basically is getting all the teeth in the same plane. All of these saws are in good shape. Now, they don't necessarily need that. You don't have a lot of wandering. Uh, but if you did need that, what you would do is just put the saw in a vise and you'd run this over it a few times until you have a bright point. By bright, I mean a shiny reflection on each of the tips of the teeth. And at that point, you know they're all in the same plane and then you can move on to sharpening. Um, but one of these is, is useful for that. Now for saw files, um, you have these triangular files, right? And they're all you know, 60 degrees. So saw teeth have the gullet. This is a 60 degree angle. <clears throat> and you have different sizes with the same angles. So this is a bigger one. This is for something like uh, a bigger rip, rip saw like this, um, this 7 PPI um, rip saw. But then as you get into finer saws like uh, this one. This one is actually filed for crosscut. But a file like this, it would be very difficult to get in there just because it's kind of big and chunky. You want something finer, so you go with a smaller file. And this one is actually also cuts a little bit finer, which is good because um, you want to avoid getting the big kind of burr that you'd get from a bigger, coarser file. It doesn't matter so much with a big rip saw. So Really, you only need kind of two files. And again, if you go to, uh, uh, if you buy used or new, you can get files like this without handles and you can just make a little handle. This is just pine whittled um, whole board and then you just stick the, the file in there. So you just need a few files. Um, then you need, I would say, you don't absolutely need, but it's really useful to have a saw vise. So this one, this is an old cast iron one, works great. It has this kind of ball and socket joint, so you can loosen that and adjust it and turn it however you want to orient uh, your saw on your bench. It clamps to the end of the bench. Uh, it's great, very useful if you can find one of those. Uh, this one's kind of cool. This is a wooden one. It was uh, like a shop-made version. It has two... Uh, little knobs here for tightening down. Um, this one would either clamp or bolt to the bench. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have any of those, you can use a face vise and you can just use boards uh, in between. Let's say, let's say I'm using this one. You would have to use boards. Sometimes you'd have to be creative with the shimming because of course your, your handle here will scrunch in there. You don't want to 
mash it and bend your saw. Uh, so you'd have to shim it out with a board here, but you could set it there um, and that could work just fine. Basically, you want to clamp the saw as close to the tooth line as you can so you don't get vibration as you're sharpening. So that's what these things are really good for. Uh, if I'm setting this in to sharpen it, you know, you can drop that right down and have barely anything but the teeth protruding up above. And that really helps to get a nice clean uh, sharpening on there. But um, like I said, there are options. Uh, even those uh, Black & Decker Workmate benches, I used one of those for a long time just for sh sharpening saws, and it works fine. Um, so uh, another thing that I think is important to mention, if you're sharpening at your bench, uh, put some cardboard down or some paper or tape something on there. You really don't want little bits of metal filings getting into your bench top where you place nice clean boards. Uh, those little bits will, will rust in the, in the pockets or you'll put a board down and it'll drive up in and then you'll start running your plane over it and going, why do my plane marks now all have tracks in them? Because you've gotten little bits of metal uh, into the wood that you're working. So keep your, keep your bench uh, safe. Um, another thing to mention is just uh, how, uh, how you're going to approach sharpening, like what angle to the bench you're going to be. A lot of people, if you're going with a face vise or if you're going to mount a vise like this here or even one of these, um, they'll do it so that it's following the bench, it's parallel to the bench. So your tooth line is like this and you're looking across. And um, I actually do it 90 degrees to that. And so if you do it this way, you have the benefit of having light come in and you're able to see from one angle of your teeth, right? You can see the light shining across and you see shiny points. You know what you've sharpened and what you haven't. I like to do it this way so that the source of light is shining right straight down along the spine of the saw, so to speak. So this way, I'm able to look, I'm able to see, I can sharpen both teeth in both directions without having to make any adjustments. I can get right up over it and look down. And the other practical consideration is that that's the only way uh, these kind of vices will mount to a bench that has a big apron. Uh, unless you are clever and modify something, maybe you cut out a little notch so it can clamp right here. Um, but I like doing it this way. I've really grown accustomed to it. You'll have to find your own way, what feels most comfortable and what gives you the best visibility. Because so much of this process is about seeing, seeing the teeth, seeing what you're doing, seeing what's been sharpened and what hasn't. Um, you really need to get a good position so you can see everything clearly. Um, some people do use, um, they'll use, you know, if they have reading glasses, you could use a, a magnifying lens on an arm. You could, you know, get that position right here so you can see what's going on. That can be really useful. So I would recommend that if you have trouble seeing things up close. Uh, I just tend to get like right in there on top of it. Um, another thing to mention is that this process makes just about the most hideous noise that you'll ever make using hand tools. It's, it's this terrible screech. Uh, so if you're doing a lot of sharpening, I'd recommend getting some, some earplugs or something, you know, put on those. If you've thrown away your table saw, go grab those uh, earmuffs that you used to have and put them on. Uh, it will help because this is a pretty piercing noise that this can make. So just to get started, um, I will say that, again, I talked about the difference between uh, rip teeth and cross-cutting teeth in a previous video. I would suggest going back and uh, checking that one out. Um, but we want to think about this in terms of, uh, or in different terminology. So with, with saw teeth, we have a number of different terms. We have rake, we have fleam, we have pitch, and we have slope. And one of those right off we can throw away, okay? So I'm going to just put this in the vise real quick so we can talk about these terms. Um, the first term that we're going to throw away is the slope. So slope is, if you have the file this way, it's a tilt in this direction or in this direction. Now, if you are just sharpening an antique saw, 
back to the way it was, you will never change the slope. You will always go horizontally. I would just throw that term out right now and not ever think about it again until you get quite advanced in saw sharpening. Another one I mentioned is rake. So if you eyeball these teeth here, you see the leading edge of the teeth is almost vertical. It's maybe tipped back a little from vertical like this. So that's the rake. Now, the more aggressive the rake, the more close, the closer to vertical the rake is of the front edge of the teeth, the more aggressively the saw is going to cut. Um, this one being a rip saw, rip saws typically be ha have between like zero and say five degrees of rake coming back. I have a rip saw that actually has, you could call it like negative rake, the teeth tip forward, and that is a super aggressive saw. Um, so as you're sharpening with a rip saw, you set the rake by the way you twist the file, right? So if I set this in here, I'm determining the rake by this face where it's engaging the tooth. So if I want to make the rake more aggressive, I just tip it closer to vertical, this face here. Um, but really, most of my sharpening, almost all of it, I keep the settings of the teeth exactly the same. Um, sometimes I will make the rake a little less up here towards the toe of the saw, just so it starts a cut a little easier, because when your rake is eased back, it does cut easier, it just cuts slower. So sometimes I'll lessen the rake up here so that the cut can start, and then you can get into using the full length of the saw. Um, so another one to talk about is fleam. Now, fleam is a fun word to throw around. Uh, it's basically just <clears throat> the angle across the saw that you're filing at. Now this is a rip saw. Most rip saws have zero fleam. The file, every, every tooth can be filed the same way. I can just go across here and do this one. I can go right to the next one. Everyone is filed exactly the same way because the fleam is zero. Now, if I'm using a crosscut saw, that is the difference between a crosscut and a rip saw, by the way, is the fleam. A crosscut saw has fleam. So you have half the teeth, are oriented where you sharpen it this way, and half the teeth are this way. And so when you add fleam, a saw cuts a lot smoother, but it cuts a lot slower. And so with a crosscut saw, the fleam turns these blunt chisel points, these uh, you know chisels that engage like this, it turns them into rows of knives, and those knives just slice across the wood uh, grain. So you add fleam to a crosscut saw, um, other saws that are specialized for ripping, like a dovetail saw, they often have a little bit of fleam, just because it makes the cut a little bit smoother, even if it's slower. With a dovetail saw, you're not really looking for, you know, just top speed. You want a little bit of, you know, added smoothness of cut and that kind of thing. So you will find with dovetail saws, though they are rip, they will often have a few degrees of fleam. So you got to look for that. Uh, it can be tough to see, especially with such tiny teeth, but um, you just have to look close and, uh, and you'll see if it's there. <clears throat> so uh, to get into this, what I would suggest is, first of all, you've, you've bought your saw or you have your saw already. It's a nice clean one. You found the, the tooth line is nice and straight. You don't need to joint it. You just want to sharpen it. I usually would suggest setting the saw first. Now there are some people who like to set it after it's sharpened. The reason I, I think it's better to set it before you sharpen it is because it does give you a little more room to get the, um, the saw file in there if the teeth are splayed out at their right angles. And also it um, helps to minimize the risk of later nicking one of those nice sharp edges as you go along with the saw set. Because you're laying this metal tool directly on top of this, like imagine freshly filed saw, and you're sliding it along, you're trying to be careful, but you might accidentally catch it or give it a little pull or something, and you'll kind of uh, rub that edge down. So I suggest setting it before you sharpen it. So to set a saw, I'll just give a, a, a quick demo on this one. Um, I don't know if you can come in here and see this. <clears throat> But you can see how the tooth, the teeth are already wandering. You have this way, that, that way, this way, that way, alternating back and forth. Does that show up very well? OK. You'll have to take my word for it. But we already have a bit of set 
in this saw. And usually you can feel set just by taking your fingers and coming down like this. And so I would say the set is fairly decent in this one. You could try measuring set. Some people will measure with a pair of digital calipers. They'll measure like this to say that that'll give the overall offset of the teeth. And then they measure the plate uh, just below it because some, some saws have tapered plates. So you'd want to do it like right here. Uh, so you can tell the difference between this and this. And you can say, okay, that's my set. Um, and again, it's really a matter of what you prefer in, in what you're cutting with your saw. But to set a saw, you take your saw set and you, um, you adjust it to what you want. I'm going to have this quite minimal. So I'm going to go to like uh, 11 here. Like I said, this doesn't necessarily correspond with exactly what your TPI or PPI is, but an 11 is a very mild set. And so you lay it on here. And I'll start with this tooth here, which is already uh, set over on this side. So a quick squeeze till it bottoms, you release, and that, that tooth is set. So then you move up, you skip one, you go to the next one, give it a squeeze, skip one, move up to the next one, give it a squeeze, and you can keep marching on like that. It's super easy. You don't have to like squeeze the, the daylights out of it. You just keep sliding up. All right, so I'm going to stop there. Like I said, tape is useful because I, I don't want to put you through the boredom of watching me set and then sharpen this entire saw. So I'm just putting a piece of tape there so I know where I left off with setting this. So to set the teeth moving the other direction, you simply flip around. Set it on here. <clears throat> Oftentimes, I don't bother with these uh, the heel most teeth for saw setting. You don't often go here. Um, plus the, the plate kind of falls away here, so you can't exactly get this to balance on there easily. So I'll just skip one and go up to that one, skip, go to there, skip, go to there, skip. And you can very quickly run down the plate, even on a big long saw like this. Uh, setting teeth is exactly the same with a finer saw except you just have to, it's slower because you have a lot more teeth and you have to watch very closely. Some of these saw sets, um, this striker is actually too big to set a fine saw. Like I was looking at this one and if you can see the striker in here, it's quite big. Um, where it hits the anvil there, there are a lot of saws whose teeth are way finer than that and you actually run the risk of grabbing two teeth at the same time and bending them in the same direction which wouldn't be good um, especially if one teeth, tooth is already bent in the other way you risk snapping that tooth so a couple things you can do i've seen how people have modified these things they'll actually file this thing down so it's a tapered triangle that fits very small teeth or you can just go and look for another one of these that's uh, for a finer saw Okay, <clears throat> so I have set my teeth here to this point. I have a piece of tape over here. Um, so I'm going to look at, first of all, sharpening this rip saw. Um, there's another consideration that we have to take in when we are sharpening a crosscut saw, but we'll get there. I want to do this one because uh, rip saws are the easiest to sharpen. It's super simple. Because you're just going straight across, there's nothing to consider really aside from that. Um, you start here, you take a look, nothing shiny. Um, so I'm just going to set my file in. I can see my rake here. It's just resting right there. I'll pick a number. Usually when I sharpen, I think I do um, two passes. So I'll file it twice. One, two. Now I go to the next tooth. One two, next tooth, one, two. Okay, so you get the idea. I'm doing two passes on each tooth. If you come uh, this way and look down, you can see how the, the front edges of those teeth are all shiny now. So the back edges, you can see 
where the file pass was made and then the front edges where the rake is, they're all shiny and clean. And you can feel it too. It's like that, that cat claw feeling, right? It's prickly. So at this point, to finish sharpening the saw, I just run all the way to the end. And again, when you set the saw in the vise, you want the teeth as low as they can go. This is bottomed out in this vise right now. As I get further out towards the toe of the saw, I'll be able to lower it a little because it's just that the saw plate is so thick right here. But as you march along, keep the, the part of the saw you're sharpening fully within the vise. Don't run out to here because the saw will start buzzing and that will get annoying. So you just move it to here, keep the teeth really low, and you can just file along. So I'm going to look at uh, this crosscut saw now. <clears throat> so like I said, this one is in good shape. It's actually in a decent state of sharpening, but it was uh, the one I pulled out from under the bench this morning. So we will take a look at it. Um, as I mentioned, when you're sharpening crosscut, you have uh, some fleam to consider. And so a crosscut saw, uh, um, a back saw like this, often has something like 20 to maybe 30 degrees of fleam. If you're just doing a crosscut hand saw, it's probably 20 or less. But um, one of the best ways to determine the amount of fleam in the saw is just to kind of eyeball, find a tooth, lay your file in there and look at that and say, okay, this looks like, you know, 20 or 30 degrees. I can honestly say I have personally never measured to see what I'm sharpening my saw at. I just look at that and say, that's the amount I want. It rests while the, the file is just resting right on the tooth. And that's what you want to go with. But it can be useful to have a little template or a cheat sheet if you, um, if you wanna get your muscle memory fixed around those angles. So one thing that I uh, have seen done and I have uh, talked about doing before is uh, you can get a little uh, protractor or something to fix an angle, fix it at 20 degrees and just get a little piece of paper and then you can just do a series of lines, all right? Now you could load this, whoop, don't put your finger in the way. You could load this up with lines. You don't really need to, but you can do one side in one direction and then flip it over. And then you can do a few more. And what these do is it gives you something visual, visually to look down on. Because you do, as you sharpen these, you do all the teeth in one direction. So if I put this right in here next to the bench, I can look right down on this and see exactly how I need to be holding my file. Right? So in order to start, I get this lined up. This edge of the paper is parallel to the spine. I pick a tooth, <clears throat> and I can see exactly how this little knife I'll start with this one. This is the third tooth in. But I see my little knife bevel. I lay this on and I eyeball it right up with my black line. And I'll take two passes. One, two. Okay, now I skip a tooth. One, two. Now skip a tooth. One, two. And you'll find, you know, it won't take long before you don't need the paper anymore. So you can continue on. If you want, slide the paper up. Keep eyeballing your teeth, Just pause and look down, make sure you're doing what you want to be doing until again, you've marched all the way to the end. Now I keep the saw right where it is. You can flip your paper and start back here. Look, find the tooth that you sharpened before the starting one, go to the next one. So now we're sharpening in this direction. So check your file, make sure it's sitting down in the gullet. Everything's good. Two passes. Skip a tooth. Skip a tooth. Skip a tooth. Okay. And I actually love saw sharpening. It's really fun when you get into the groove 
you get like a third of the way in, you're really moving along. Um, I will say I start at the heel because my first strokes usually catch. I feel like I'm not into it and I go like this and I go K -k -k -k. and um, it doesn't matter as much with these teeth. Uh, you might beat them up a little bit. It matters more with these teeth because these are where you usually start a cut. So I would suggest starting back here under the handle. These teeth don't get used all that much. By the time you're up like an inch in, you're going to be going really smoothly and you'll, you'll be in a groove. You'll have your angle down and everything else. So I think for today, that about covers the basics of sharpening. Uh, we're going to, in a future video, do some troubleshooting, uh, how to fix a saw that it seems like it's wandering, seems like it's binding, seems like it has some issues. Uh, but if you are interested in this kind of stuff, in looking at tools, uh, the nuances of tools, how to get them up and running and working well, uh, you should check out the MT Daily Dispatch up here. You can subscribe. Every day we post uh, new media content uh, about hand tools, about timber frames, about all kinds of stuff going on. So, yeah, thanks for watching.